Praise God. Are you ready, church? Are you ready? Holy God. Lord, prepare our hearts for this time. God, this is not Sunday. It's also not Monday. God, today is the day you've made. So God, we want to receive what you have for us now. We don't want to think forward and we don't want to think backward. We want to be right in this moment. We ask God that you would just visit this place with your Holy Spirit. And God, you would fill every heart that the temple as of old may your Heavenly Father be filled with the smoke of the glory of the presence of the Lord. That God, we may be changed. For God, we need to be less of earth and more of heaven. We need to know more of Jesus and less of ourselves. So God, do that work. We're asking you. We're in, in, in with, with feeling, with emphasis, we're saying, Lord, do this in me, in my life, in my decisions. And God, I believe we get to the place where we need to be through the praise, through the worship that we give to you. God, we open ourselves up and give you room to work. So God, in this time, we take that time. We don't jump into anything, but God, we prepare our hearts before you. Dear God, in, in, in essence, we take off our shoes believing this is not an academic exercise. This is holy ground. And we honor you as someone special in this place. As someone highly exalted in our estimation. And dear God, we ask you to reign in us. Reign in this time. And teach and lead in God as you see fit. And dear Father, our job is to glorify you through our worship, through our listening, and through our response. So God be praised. Glory to your name in this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Good to be in God's house tonight. Amen. Uh, I'm still enjoying Sunday service. <laughs> but we have a new day God has made and you here tonight. And we're blessed. We have some people I hadn't seen before. That maybe they've been here before, but I hadn't seen you. But make yourself at home. We appreciate you being here. And uh, we come tonight to worship the Lord. And I was thinking about the Sunday service, how the Holy Spirit moved. And God, He's always here for us. But uh, I've been asking to keep it up. And so I want to sing one of them old songs tonight, He Abides. So let's do that tonight and go over our service. But again, this He Abides.
The psalmist says, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Yes. <laughs> worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Would you stand with me one more time? I want us to sing a little chorus. It says, let that be glory and honor and praise. Let's not be so busy that we forget 
it's a privilege not to have to go here and there constantly and not have it always available to us. It's good then we can focus on the most important things because like church, we ain't shutting down in the next half hour. Those things are always open, always available, and we ought always to take advantage of it. Well, we've been taking a opportunity to um, study the Word of God together. Come on, Brother TV. I don't really know about you, but I've been enjoying these lessons on Wednesday night. It's not formal. I mean, I know it's not a Sunday morning service. It's just more formal. We have more discussion. But I'm really okay with that. Because, you know what? I like to talk about the Word of God. I don't think we talk about it enough. And I don't think we talk about what we find out of it enough. I mean, Lee and I talk about it, but that's, that's just in our home. But as church folks talk about what this is what God has shown me, this is what God has... has given me in His Word, I think that's a good thing. I think that's an encouraging thing. So we have been going through that, and tonight is TV Gonces night. So our, our men's ministry director, our technical guru, um, he is also going to be our teacher for the evening. We're going to have some discussion afterwards, but I just look forward to what he'd have to say. Miss Jean Howard is supposed to do it next week, so we'll see. She said she was. So um, that, that, that should be interesting. But she did say, I don't know if you want to hear what I have to say. So, I better wear steel toes next week. Because she might get on all of us. <laughs> but I think, you know, as faithful as she is to the Lord, I think she's got a little right to speak the word of the Lord in the way she should. And maybe we all need it in that way. But, but for tonight, Brother TV, would you please come? Would you share the word of God with us? Which, which would you like? Yes. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm personally glad Ms. Jean Howard will be speaking next week. That way, if uh, I don't say anything helpful to you, I know she will. <laughs> um, I, can, I can get up in front of people all day and act like a goofball. I'm good at that. But um, when it comes to talking serious stuff, then uh, in my mind at least, uh, I don't do as good a job. But I hope that you get some, something good out of what I have to say tonight. Uh, the pastor's been asking everyone to uh, go over the verses that, that you sign up for and, and just tell what you got. So that's, that's what I'm going to do tonight. Uh, I have, is it Tet? Yes, sir. Silent H. Uh, Tet is a section I have, and this in Psalms 119, of course, starting with verse 65. Uh, I'm going to be reading on the, on the screen is the NLT, New, New Living Translation. It's, uh, it's my favorite because it's easier for me a little bit so, to understand. So, um, you go ahead and put that first verse up. I'm trying. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I know how that job is. Um, so, we've had people do, do it different ways when they, they've been up here. Uh, I'm going to do it, uh, I'll read this verse and I'll take my thoughts on that verse and I'll get to the next one until we get through all of it. So starting off with verse 65, it says in the NLT version, You have done many good things for me, Lord, just as you promised. So let me start off by asking how many people here tonight can say that God has done many good things for me? We all should be able to say that. Because if we can't think about some big thing that he has done for us lately, what about the fact that he woke you up this morning? Or what about the fact that you made it here tonight? You're still breathing. I mean, what you could think of a million little things that God does for you. We think they're little, but we kind of take it for granted. So I think the problem, you know, that so many people have with saying that God is good and does good things for them, the people of the world, as they look at what God does by man's standard. You can look at what's going on in the world today, and you can think, you know, the people of the world's like, there's no God. If there was a God, this one happened, and that one happened, and this one happened. And if there was a God, I wouldn't have to go through this thing, you know, that I'm going through right now. The problem with that is that they're looking at what they believe is the standard for good. And they're, they're applying that to God. But the, key, the New King James Version of that 
verse, if you look at it, it reads, Thou hast dwelt well with thy servant according to what? His word. So God is good according to His word. And when people of the world and Christians try to hold God to our standard, then we kind of falter and we don't see how good He truly is. So, am I saying God doesn't guarantee you a trial-free life? That's exactly what I'm telling you. God doesn't guarantee any of us a trial-free life. He works according to His Word, which is the true good Word. The true standard of good. He doesn't spare us from trials, but He will send us through trials that are required to bring out His blessed will for our lives. So His Word, you know, it tells us you're going to go through things. It is necessary for you to go through things so that I can teach you and I can bring you to where you need to be. I got to reading about uh, a man, uh, some of you may have heard, I know you might have heard of him, Reverend John Brown of Scott. Uh, and I got to reading about him and I saw a quote by him when I was just looking up, researching things about God being good and put, putting us through trials. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about his life before I read you the quote that just spoke to me. All right, Reverend John Brown of Scotland, his father died when he was 11. His mother died shortly after that. He himself was brought so low by four fevers that people doubted he would even survive. He recovered from his illness and he found a friend who gave him a job. He had to scratch and claw to get by, trying to get to where he could minister the word, teaching people. He went through six successions in the church when he did get involved in the church, different problems. And then when he finally did become a pastor, he had to deliver three sermons and a lecture every Sunday and visit during the week. So, I don't know how any of us like that. As you can imagine, it had a lot of wear and tear on his life. And that finally caught up with him. And he spent the last years of his life in very poor health with stomach problems, which eventually took his life. But his last words before he took his final breath was, My Christ. After going through all that, but the quote I found that meant so much to me, I haven't told you what this man went through. He said, There's no doubt I have met with trials as well as others. Yet so kind God has been to me that I think that if he were to give me as many years as I have already lived in the word in the world, I should not desire one single circumstance in my life to be changed, except that I wish I had less sin. That, I mean, blew me away. Here's all the stuff this guy went through, and he says he won't change a single thing except he wishes that he had sinned this. Oh, that we would, would all have that mindset. And I could uh, I could spend more time talking about him, but I, uh, my wife says I used too many words, so I'm going to move on. Uh, but I encourage you to read up on uh, Reverend John Brown Scott and his life sometimes. All right, verse 66. I believe in your commands. Now teach me good judgment and knowledge. This is a prayer for wisdom. And how many of us can use more wisdom from God? Every, every one of us. We as Christians need to live in good judgment and knowledge. But how many times in our life do we forget our need to learn good judgment and knowledge and we're quick to trust our own heart and conscience. How many times have you faced a situation, I know I have, where, you know, I could pray about this, but I don't think I got this with God. This is an easy one. I know what I need to do. Uh, I, I feel like that you're good with me doing this and we trust our heart. But what's the problem with trusting our heart? 
We're human, and we don't always know what's best for us, no matter how much we want to think we do. If we really do believe God's Word, then we should want Him to teach us to live wisely and obediently. Verse 67. I used to wander off until you disciplined me, but now I closely follow your word. Now here, the psalmist, I think, is speaking of something we can all relate to, learning something the hard way. How many times do we get ourselves into situations where we are afflicted when we could have avoided the situation by closely following God's word? That kind of goes back to what I was saying a minute ago. We think we know best, and we get ourselves in situations. But, according to the Word, sometimes it takes that affliction or that discipline from God to get us back on track and to closely follow His Word. You know, God, he, He'll let us decide, and He'll let us go off on our own, and He'll let us do that, that thing that we want to do, make that decision. But, you know, if it's not in His will, you're going to face discipline. And you're going to face some affliction for that decision. But the great thing about God is He uses that to bring you back on His path and to follow His Word. Verse 68. And I love this one. You are good and you do only good. Teach me your decrees. It's interesting to me here that the psalmist calls God good when he just talked about the afflictions that he faced. He didn't become bitter or resentful toward God. And I, I could say a lot more about that one, but I don't want to take away from another verse uh, that I'm getting to in a minute. So. I, I'll move on from that for now. But just keep that in mind. He could have been bitter and resentful toward God, but he wasn't. He called God good. Verse 69. Arrogant people smear me with lies, but in truth I obey your commandments with all my heart. So I don't think I have to convince anybody here tonight if you try to live for God, there's going to be times that people come against you for it in your life. In today's world, it's not the cool thing to be a Christian. And some even view Christianity as part of the problem. On my job throughout the week, I'm on the computer almost all day. I see a, a lot of uh, articles. I see a lot of stuff online. And I cannot tell you, especially in, the, in recent months, uh, there's at least four to five articles I see every week that don't come out and say that Christianity is the problem, but they find subtle ways to blame Christianity. You know, and I read these articles, and we talked about, uh, and I forgot who it was that was up here that night, but you talked about it afterwards, about uh, burning with anger. And, uh, you know, I, I read some stuff and, and just the way it's worded, and it's just, ugh. You know, it gets to me because, you know, as a Christian, it offends me that, that I would be reading somebody, somebody's basically saying, you know, it's, it's my fault and your fault as a Christian that, that things are bad in the world. When I think, no, I mean, if, if you follow the only good that there is, then that would solve the problem. So, to me, you know, the most important message in verse 69 that the psalmist is conveying to us is to not let it distract or discourage us when people do come against us. Now, you know, I feel, I, I was a kid once, seems like eons ago, but, uh, you know, I feel bad for, for kids nowadays. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong, things have been bad when all of us were little. Maybe it wasn't publicized like it is today. But all of us when we were little have had to face things. But you know, the kids today, you know, they go to school and they're just not cool if they're, you know, don't do everything that everybody else is doing and if they want to try to follow God. 
Um, you know, I've my own children. I've, you know, your heart breaks for them. Uh, I, we've had one of them come home and, and in tears because, you know, people at school were asking, you know, kind of not really bullying them or picking on them, but just kind of treat them like they're different because they don't go along with everything else. And it's just important as Christians, uh, even adults, we deal with that. Um, people make comments at your job, you know, offhanded comments uh, about you and because they know that you're, you're different. So just don't let it distract you or discourage you when people do come against you. You have to keep your focus on what is good. And as the New King, New King James Version tells us of, of verse 69, we should keep his precepts and, or commandments with our whole hearts. You should go after God, follow him with your whole heart. Don't half-heart it because all these people, all these things coming against you, if you're, you're not totally invested, they could bring you down. So you've got to guard yourself with that. Uh, verse... Their hearts are dull and stupid, <laughs> but I delight in your instructions. Um, you know, I was kind of like, ooh, I'm going to call somebody stupid. <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> but uh, this verse is not actually calling people dull and stupid. What it's referring to is their hearts being dull or insensitive. While the world finds their delight in whatever they can find to satisfy their wants at the particular moment, the psalmist here is saying that his delight comes from the Word of God. That's where our delight should come from. Um, there's a lot of things that you can be delighted in. Nothing wrong with a lot of them. But our true delight should come from the Word of God, and we should strive to have our hearts in tune with God's Word. Alright, verse 71. This is my favorite. And this one is, is really, when I saw this one, I knew why. Because originally I was supposed to do this weeks from now. But uh, pastor said this this one was open up. I said, well, let me move up. Go ahead and do it. So, and then I read this verse. I was like, that's why. So 71, my suffering was good for me. For it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. My suffering was good for me. Does anyone in here like to suffer? You don't? That's great, isn't it? <laughs> well, nobody likes affliction coming against them, but the psalmist here says that it was good for him. And he's got to be wrong about that, right? There's no way suffering can be good. Well, what about a few examples from the Bible? Let's talk about Noah. God told Noah to build a ark. It was sunshine. Noah, he was ridiculed, mocked. Uh, people laughed at him. You know, I, I can imagine, I mean, I don't read it anywhere, but they probably threw stuff at him. You know, they might have shoved him when they walked by. I mean, he just, but uh, he, he had to endure all that suffering while he was doing something that God told him to do. But uh, nothing good came of that, did it? A lot of good came from that. But what about Daniel? Daniel refused to do what the king said to do. And what did the king do? Threw him in a lion's den. He suffered. Nothing good came of Daniel going in the lion's den, did it? Yeah, I believe it did. What about the example of Jonah? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. And he said, uh-uh. He took off the other way. Got swallowed, spent three days in the belly of a well. Nothing good came of that, right? He was in a smelly fish for days. A whole town got saved. And Jonah stopped and thinking, hey, you know, maybe if God tells me to do something, I might need to do it. 
And what about Joseph? Think about all that happened to Joseph. And all that he went through, slavery, you know, his, his own family doing what they did to him. Nothing good came from that, surely. He was in the perfect position because of that suffering to save his land. Because of the suffering. Now you might hear all these, you might say, that, that's, that's cool TV, but those are people in the Bible. You know, those are real people, but that's the people I read about. So, well let me tell you a, a personal example. You, uh, most of you here know me, a lot of you have known me for years. So I want to tell you why I believe this, that my suffering was good for me. Um, not a part of my life that I like to talk about too often. As a matter of fact, if I had a, a choice to erase one part, I would erase this one. Um, I guess it was my early, uh, yeah, maybe early to mid 20s. I was dating someone. And my first red flag should have been that this person was not saved and did not go to church. But I, I had this thing about me growing up uh, where most people just, you know, didn't think about anything relationship-wise. They went out and had fun. I always said, hey, I just want to find somebody. Uh, I want to be married by the time I'm 21. Don't ask me why that age. I just, that, was, that was it. That's, I mean, that's all I thought about growing up. That's all I wanted. I didn't want to go around and do anything else. So, you know, I started dating someone, and as a Christian, to date a non-Christian is not the best idea in the world. The Bible tells you that. But I didn't listen. I didn't listen, didn't see all the warning signs. We probably dated for three and a half years. She was a few years younger than I was, so she was maybe around 20. All right, so the time come that we were going to get married. Well, again, you know, there's just this little tug in there. Should be doing this. Oh, well, you know, God will be fine. Because in the meantime, she had started coming to church, um, seemed to be safe living a Christian life to me, you know, as far as I knew. So I'm like, no, we're good, God, because, you know, she's, she's good now. She's in church. She's... So we came up after three and a half years of dating. We got married standing up here in this church. That's, that's why I tell you, if I could erase the time, I, I would do it. Uh, a mere three months after that, it was over. Uh, we were actually involved with another church doing a uh, ministry thing called Judgment House. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. Uh, she <laughs> met someone at this church ministry outreach thing and just took off. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to be married anymore. It's, you know, I didn't want to get married, but I, I thought since we'd already bought stuff that I should go through with it. Was, was what I, the explanation I got. I, it, telling you what I, I told you earlier about my life and all I wanted, and all that, that destroyed me. You know, because... The devil jumps in at times like that. You know, he says, you know, well, you're not good enough for anybody. You weren't good enough for her, you weren't good enough for anybody. And, you know, I was, I got so low. The pastor here at the time was worried about me. My family was worried about me. It was just a, a rough time. Uh, just bad time. You know, it got to the bad enough that I was, I was driving home one night about... I don't know, four or five months after she had left. Uh, my grandparents lived in Georgia at the time. I was driving home, and it was a bad thunderstorm. I was by myself. I went to visit them. And, you know, I was, like I said, just heartbroken, just feeling this hopeless, you know, just trying to hang on with all I've got. And, you know, I actually, the devil starts working on my mind. You know, you're driving by yourself. Sometimes you've got time to think. Use that for prayer, that's a great thing. But if you start letting your mind wander on stuff, that can be bad. And the thought actually come to my mind 
What have you got to live for? Why don't you just, why don't you just veer this car off the road? And at that time, you know, I, I pulled the car over and, and broke down and prayed to God because that scared me. Yeah. When that thought entered my mind, I never thought anything like that, no matter what was going on. But, you know, it was just, like I said, it was a rough time. I, I can't even begin to describe it. And I'm not going into great detail or anything. I would come in church, I would go in the booth back there, I would do my thing. As soon as they were praying, I would shoot out that door. So I wouldn't have to talk to anybody, and I wouldn't have to... Yeah, I was trying to live for God like I had been living for God, but it's, you know, it's just, I had something on me. But, you know, I got through all that. And I got through all that with God. I didn't get angry with God because it wasn't God's fault. I didn't listen to God. And you, you hear all that and you hear me tell that. You say, well, TV, how can you say that that was good for you to go through that? Because at the time, I didn't know that was good. And I saw no way that could be good. Well, you know, out there in that building and downstairs, I can tell you why it was good. Because... God used that situation to open my eyes and not do it myself anymore. He said, let me do it. I let everything go. I said, God, you, you know what I've always wanted in my life? I'm not doing anything anymore. I'm giving it all to you. And he blessed me with the family I have today. And because I went through that suffering, it was good because I appreciate what I have. I appreciate what God has for me, and that's what He does for us. When we go through suffering, He says, okay, you messed up. You messed up, you're in a bad place. But if you look at me, I'll bring you back. Amen. He uses that as lessons for us. And I want to go a little bit further than the psalmist did here. Not only is it good for us to suffer when we bring afflictions on ourselves, but it also works out for good when we go through suffering we have no control of. And I know you might think, uh, all right, now you're talking crazy, TV. How is it good for us to suffer through things that we didn't have any control over? The greatest example I can give you of all time, Jesus Christ. He didn't do a single thing to deserve anything that he went through. He was treated badly, ridiculed, beaten, spit on, tried, sentenced, and crucified. What good came out of that? All of us in the building tonight should know the answer to that. Our salvation. If he would not have done that, where would any of us be? And quickly, I know I need to move on, to give you, again, a personal example of that. I was in a freshman year of high school, uh, 14 years old, in 1994, uh, going to 96 High. And on a Sunday night, uh, I went to bed. Uh, I had to go lay down with my brother, my younger brother, because he didn't think it was fair that I stayed up and he didn't. So uh, he would go to sleep and I could get back up. As long as you get up, you can, you can stay up as long as you want to. That particular night, I was laying in my bed, and I looked across the hallway into my parents' room, and my mom was standing at her dresser, just doing something, you know, putting something up, doing something in her room. That night, I didn't get back up. I fell asleep. I fell asleep right after I saw my mom standing at her dresser, and I woke up to an ambulance taking her out of our house. And she was gone unexpected. Uh, to say that that turned our lives upside down is an understatement. Um, 14 years old is you know, kind of an awkward age anyway, <laughs> you're a freshman in high school. And you know, my dad loved us, my dad did, did good, uh, good job, as good as he could do. But you know, there's nothing like a mom. I mean, let's be, let's be honest. I will say, I tell my kids all the time, you better hope nothing ever happens to your mom. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to be eating spam and, and take it all. And your hair is just going to have to look like mine because I, 
I can't do anything with it. But you know, there's something about a, a mother's love. And I miss sharing so many events in my life with my mom. And I still miss her like crazy. Um, you know, I was about to start driving. I graduated high school. You know, grandkids. Oh, I think about how she would have been with the grandkids. And you know, and I, I keep her memory alive and they know about her. But you know, it's just, it's rough. It's not the same as having her here. But what good came out of that? What good came out of all that suffering? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have a cousin and I have a good friend right here that said that, you know, years after that happened, when that happened to your mom and she was 36 years old, it, it got my attention and made me want to start, you know, looking at my life and following God. So if one teenager's focus was turned on God, because who else can I rely on at a time like that? You know, just like uh, Haley said last week, she questioned God. Oh, I, yeah, I said, you know, why my mom, God? Why? You know, like that, 36 years old. But, you know, I didn't blame God. I wasn't angry at God. And I had to lean on God to get through that. So if my focus was turned completely on God and two souls were set on the right path or started thinking about how they were living their life, how can I say that wasn't good? That was a purpose. It was a, a, a bad time I had to go through suffering. My whole family did, but it had a great purpose. If you think of some of the darkest times in your life, I bet somewhere in those times you can think of something good that come out of it. It was a horrible time that you had to live through. It may be something you still think about. But I bet you if you think hard enough and pray about it, you can think about something good that God made out of that. Whether it was suffering for something of your own doing or that you had no control over. Because God, what does He do? He works all things together for good for those who love Him. Yes. And if He said it, it has to be true. In verse 72, Your instructions are more valuable to me than millions in gold and silver. The psalmist here, he recognized that no comfort or riches were more valuable than the Word of God. There are a ton of things that we can value in our life. Those things can be great to have, but you know the thing about them, eventually all of it's going to go away. But the Word of God is yes. never going away. Thank you. It's going to stand forever. Thank you. So the Word of God should be the most valuable thing in our lives. And there's nothing wrong with having valuable things, and I'm not saying that. I mean, that, you know, that's great if you have valuable things, but your focus should be on the Word of God, and it should be more valuable to you than anything else in your life. Uh, I hope that you've got something that you can take out of that, and I'm going to turn it over to the pastor at this time and let him speak. Thank you so much, TV. I think I can really add anything to that, uh, TB, because your your my thoughts very much aligned with yours. I want I do want to hammer a few things that you hammered in this little title because to be honest with you, this is the kind of lesson I'd like to sweep away. I'd like to go ahead and let's talk about the blessings of God and the favor of God and all the good stuff. Let's get to that. I don't want I don't want to emotionally deal with this kind of lesson, but it's there. It's in the Word of God. And it's true to life, we just want to forget about it. We are very privileged, and that privilege has made us, in some ways, soft. We can't deal with depression. We can't deal with struggle, especially the younger we get. The more we are divorced from hardship, the harder it is to deal with. Uh, your grandparents, I couldn't hold a candle to. I can't hold a candle to most of you. 
So I understand that because they knew trouble, hardship, a faith that cost you something. The further we, by the blessings of God, have gotten away from that, we've just gotten like old Israel. They forgot about the goodness of the Lord. And it talks about that in here. So I, I wanted to hit that just so that we could be uncomfortable just for a little bit more. And maybe our faith for a little bit more. But let me ask you, what pain, as he's talking about, what pain is good pain? Is there any? Is there good pain? There was a book, um, he dealt with it somewhat a disappointment with God. But Philip Yancey wrote that book, Disappointment with God. He wrote an earlier book, him and a medical doctor, about the goodness of pain. Um, and we, we know this in some regards. People with, with um, um, uh, problems that, that begin to affect their extremity, whether it's, it's diabetes or stuff like that, or where you begin to lose feeling in your extremities. Pain is a good thing. If you don't know whether that step off of the front porch has injured you or not, you could produce great damage to yourself, which can turn to gangrene bad enough and could kill you without pain, how do you ever know? How do you ever know that you got too close to the saw, Brother Randall? How, how do you know if the stove's hot? You don't know those things without pain. You don't know that you should be quit doing some things unless pain reminds you. So there is a gift of pain. We don't want it, but it still serves a good purpose in our lives. And so when he said, I went astray, he went astray, he, he was afflicted, he was afflicted after he went astray. So he, he, he got off the road and his affli the affliction was bringing him back to God. See, as Lewis famously quoted, the pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. We listen when pain comes our way. We become very keen in our attention when it does. God has used it for generations. So pain is helpful to us. It is a good thing. You see it even in the psalmist here, which is very powerful. The opposite, and um, TV touched on it. I, I, I'm a little disappointed. You, you, you had you had that about that heart, that insensitive, stupid heart. Let me let me give you a little definition here. Of what it says here. It's, it's strangely more literally in, in some others. As well, it talks about the um, heart that's fat. It's fat like grease. It's gross like fat. Now, now fat is not. We're we're in a different generation today. Fat, fat's bad, 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 bad. We've learned a lot of health issues. But in the, in the Bible, it isn't always that case. You want the the fat of the sheep or the animal that belonged to God because that showed the richness of the animal. You wanted you wanted my olives. You wanted fat. I mean, you wanted, you wanted the luxury to come out of that. It was a sign of God's favor. But whenever it's used of a person, remember in, in, um, in the book of Judges, it talked about one of those, one of those uh, heathen kings. He was, he was way blessed, so much that his, his, you know, his belt couldn't even hold him up anymore. And, and when he was stabbed by the judge of Israel, the fat covered the dagger. I mean, it was just way, it was grossly over-blessed in his life. It took in so much that it made him insensitive to the things of life. And the Bible used that in several different cases. In, in Isaiah, it talks about their heart has become callous. It's become, it's become fat. And, and it talks about also in the prophets how he, um, he uh, that they had become like, like the cattle. They had become fat and sleek. Now, Miss, um, Miss Linda, that's what you want out of cows. You don't want skinny scrawny cows. You want them fat and you want them sleek. But in God's people, that's a bad thing. Because God meant for us to be active and to work, not to be so so inactive and so blessed that we can't move and we can't do what God wants us to do. But that's how Israel came with God's blessings. And so this is what he says of these people. He says their heart is, is so over engrossed with fat that they're insensitive and they're calloused. That's the opposite of suffering. And blessed too much? Yes. More often than not, Christianity is, is, is talked about because some Christians say, I, I, need a, I need a new streamliner jet. Well, Jesus didn't need a streamliner jet, and I doubt you do either. 
but they think they need. And they proclaim, and they even have the audacity to say, God told me that I'm supposed to have this. I want to question them, but I sure do put a big question mark in my head. Because why? What, what great purpose? There are, there are mercy hospitals that are on those planes, but you're talking about you traveling on that plane. Our hearts can become too grossly fat. We become callous to the move of God. That's why. That's why when we have great tragedies, the churches fill up. And that's why people start getting attention to God. Because it's suffering that brings them back to God when they're so blessed. What do I need God for? I get, my bank account's fine. My job is fine. My society's fine. What do I need God for? We become like that. And that's trouble for us. So even in our lives, as, as TV and my mom, and you could probably share as well, God has to say, you need me in order for that to happen. Because we can become callous and insensitive. And he pointed out one of those ways. I mean, did he not in that last verse? What did he say was one of those ways we can become callous and sensitive? Our heart can be just in Roast with fat. What, what was that thing he mentioned? Thousands of gold and silver pieces. Go out on the street. Go out in 96 and find out anybody. Take poll. Would you rather have thousands of pieces of gold and silver or the Word of God? Anybody want to take a bet who's what, which part of the day? Will it even be close? I don't know. I'd like to believe the best, but I the way this world works, I want some money. I want the thousands of pieces of gold and silver. I, I want that. I can catch up with God later. That's one of those things that can make us not listen to God. But what this psalmist said, the TV so absolutely just, just nailed here. And I, I love it. I think we all need to say it together. It's verse 68. So let's throw it back up there. This is the point. TV said it. I will remember, he's always right. Don't be quick to follow your heart. The Bible says about your heart that, that you're desperately wicked without God. Unknowable to your heart. Anybody, anybody, let me just ask you, have you ever been disgusted with you? Well, I have. I've let me down many times. So if I can't trust me, then what should I do? Trust the one who's never wrong. Well, I'm right 75% of the time. 75%? That's 25% wrong. How about trust the 100% guarantee? He's right. I'm going to preach a sermon here. It's coming soon. It's, it's coming. They, they talk about that thin blue line that we've got in America. The line's getting thinner. And I'm not talking about the level of police force. I mean how much we up, want to uphold the truth anymore. That there's any truth whatsoever. And the chaos that I see, and now in my country, won't take much to spread from coast to coast. And I poo-pooed other countries. Look how backwards they are. Land of the free, home of the brave, that carry masks not for protection and try to kill the law enforcement who will keep people from being killed and murdered and stolen from. That's what we want. That's what we're begging for. But if God's the revealer of all truth, you know it had to happen. But woe to those who call good evil and those who call evil good. Here's what we need. You are good and do only good. Let's, let's, let's say that together. You are good and do only good. Good. You are good and do only good. That's the word of God. Do we believe it? Because if we believe it, Brother Jimmy, that's what we're going to say. Teach me. <laughs> Teach me. Because I'm not always good. I don't always do good. That is character and that is action. Both one flows out of the other. He is good does good. May do the same for us. Would you please stand? I continue to be amazed at the depth of the longest chapter in the Bible about one topic in the Bible. How much of my life it really is. And how deep it really goes. 
we say we trust God. That's the verse for us. You are good. Do only good. So if I'm blessed for another 40, 50 years, great. If I get cancer tomorrow and suffer for every day for the rest of my life, He's still good. And He does only good. That is the standard. Teach me. Teach me how to be like John Brown. Teach me to be like so many missionaries out there that suffered greatly just to carry the gospel to somebody who never heard. That is good. And we need to follow. Father, I just ask you as we close out this time in your word again that you impact that like a sledgehammer into our hearts. God, what a verse to know and to quote to ourselves through good and bad times. You are good and you do only good. That's what we need to hear. That's the defense against the lies and the temptations of the enemy. Because the devil will be glad to say, live it up. Live it up. Let down the standard. Everybody else is doing it. He's got a thousand different reasons for us to give in. That verse is strong. And your spirit is working not just through blessing us, but even through affliction of God. Even in affliction. Hebrews says, whom the Lord loves, He chastises. Hmm. Whom you love, He will chastise. Discipline. Call into order. Allow suffering. So God, I don't know where these people are tonight, but I know, dear God, they have faced and will face difficult tasks in their future. Father, let this verse be a bulwark for them. Let this message be a powerful testimony to them that they don't have to prove themselves a Christian. They don't have to impress the world with how much they're blessed. No, they can suffer and still be a glorious testimony to the power of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11 has those greatly blessed by their faith in blessing, but it also has those that were greatly blessed in their suffering. God, help us to follow the same and just be good and do good like you. Father, may you be with us, may you lead us, and help us to walk like you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church, for being here tonight. We look forward to seeing you Sunday. We're willing.